powerful laptop in the world. This Threadripper 16 core 32 thread processor based laptop started as a quest for mobile computing power without paying too severe a premium for mobile hardware. I searched for an ITX Threadripper compatible motherboard but came up empty handed except for a few forum posts that said that a small form factor Threadripper was a terrible idea and immediately I knew I could be the one to make that mistake and set out to put an untamed 180 watt TDP processor in a laptop. First I had to establish the design elements that were necessary. I figured that it had to be a fully self-contained system including the compute hardware, the familiar clamshell interface of the screen, keyboard, trackpad, and sufficient onboard power to run for a reasonable length of time away from an outlet. So it was clear from the outset that the challenges of delivering power and removing heat were going to require some relatively extreme solutions. Additionally, to keep costs low, most items would either be used or salvaged from e-waste. The smallest Threadripper compatible board I could locate was the Micro ATX ASRock X399M Tai Chi, which I picked up used. For the processor, the current price to performance trade off favored the AMD Threadripper 1950X 16 core 32 thread 180 watt TDP processor, again picked up used. For the critical cooling components, I looked at the server world, selecting a Dynatron A28 1U passive Epic heatsink which is also compatible with the mounting points of the STR4 socket, and twin Delta BFB1012HH blower fans, some additional heat pipe small fans. Power delivery was one of the trickiest parts of the build. I needed a lot of juice in as little space as possible. I looked at power stations, those giant power banks with AC outlets, but between the size of the components plus converting to AC only to convert back to DC with a then onboard laptop power supply, this just got too bulky and inefficient. I looked into custom battery packs, but few went to the amperage ranges I was looking for, and I needed to work out a charging solution if I wanted. So I looked at USB-C power delivery power banks and spoofers that called for up to 20 volts from the USB-C power delivery system. This could have worked, and I almost went with five Zender Super Tank power banks in parallel. These support simultaneous pass-through charging with 100 watts in and 60 watts out. So five times 60 watts was 300 watts out, and that would give some overhead to charge the batteries, which could accept the 100 watts in at the same time if they'd been depleted before plugging. Ultimately, I went with six Dell Power Companion 18,000 milliamp hour power banks. These are designed to go in between your Dell power brick and Dell laptop, topping up the power companion's battery when you're plugged in and keeping the laptop chugging along longer when you're unplugged. Importantly, these can deliver 90 watts while plugged in and 65 watts unplugged. So six times uh, 65 watts is 390 watts total, which is near the max 400 watts of the HDplex DC ATX power supply. This is all fed by two Dell 330 watt laptop power supplies. You might have noticed the RCA wires on the front. These are for spoofing the power companions that they're being charged by a Dell adapter or telling them that they're charging a Dell thing. Red to red connects one of the PowerBricks communication pins to all of the power companions inputs saying it's a Dell OEM charger. The power companions seem to pass through power but not charge themselves if this signal is not present. White to black connects the power brick outputs back to their inputs. This is necessary for a battery only startup for the power companions to stay active, otherwise they'll shut down after several. If started via AC power, they seem to keep running indefinitely even without the loopback signal. Runtime on battery is determined by power capacity divided by usage. The six power companions are 18,000 milliamp hours, which works out to 66.6 watt hours. Times six, that's 399.6 watt hours total. Watt hour capacity is as it sounds. Around 400 watt hours together, 
means these can pump out around 400 watts for around an hour, supposing their discharge rate supports this. At full tilt, say running a benchmark or rendering a video, between the 180 watt TDP of the 1950X, the GPU, screen, and other components, DC conversion and efficiency, and fans that can themselves draw a few to several watts, let's say we're at 280 watts total. So 399.6 watt hours divided by 280 watts of constant draw equals theoretically around 1.43 hours on battery at full processor utilization. Maybe around an hour if it was a very GPU intensive load as well, and for less compute intensive tasks the battery runtime could extend. The lengthiest part of the project was building the case and laying out all the components. I repurposed an HP Media Center PC case effectively shortening it to around two inches to accommodate the motherboard I.O., RAM, and heat sinks, and salvaged some other parts from an Alienware M18X. Other key components are Corsair LPX DDR4 3600 MHz, which fit the bill of being low profile and matching the motherboard's top RAM speed spec, as well as a Zotac GTX 1050 Ti, a GPU mining riser in order to mount the GPU horizontally, an 18.3 inch portable 4K monitor and panel mount jacks for HDMI and power. Many sketchy hacksaw cuts later, we have a Threadripper laptop. Now if I had any sense, I would have gone with the Ryzen 9 3950X, which has similar horsepower at a lower TDP, but this is still quite expensive for the processor itself. And I just wanted to say, Threadripper laptop. Some Clevo-based builds already use the 3950X processor, which would outpace the 1950X if it could attain its full TDP. But alas, the 3950X is locked into eco mode, reducing the many core performance below that of the unfettered 1950X, which coincidentally makes this the fastest laptop in the world. I haven't had a chance to do much with it yet, a quick XMP profile application to take the RAM up to the 3600 MHz, boot into Bionic Pup, and Blender BMW Classroom Benchmark Session. Things are looking good so far, and I expect this will be my video editing machine for the foreseeable future. There is obviously room for improvement. After I ditched a 16X to 16X PCIe ribbon cable, I was able to mount the blower fans lower than expected and thus can drop the height of the palm rest to be more consistent with the height of the M18X chassis this borrows some parts from. Fans can probably be throttled down at idle while there are low temps for a bit quieter operation, and I need to run some extended benchmarks to see if the system is really tapping into the additional heat pipes and fins. If you made it this far, thanks for checking this project out and let me know what you'd like to see it do or thoughts on how it should evolve in the future. If you're thinking about tackling a project like this on your own, a parts list is supplied below.